The 17th century Carmelite, Purgatory, Mystic, Anne-Marie Lenmeyer, in one sentence, explains to her in her book, Mes Relations avec les âmes du Purgatoire, that you can only find in French, Portuguese, and in her native German. She tells us the types of of souls that remain the least amount of time in purgatory. You need to hear this because there's a lot to think about. In today's video, I want to talk about it, explain what she means, unpack it a little bit, and also give you some helpful advice to become that type of soul because we need to hear this and there's no easy answer. It's difficult, just be forewarned. And at the end of this video, I have about a six minute summary. If you remember, I went to Miami to see the final vows of Sister Alexia. So I will show you that whole ceremony, that mass and profession of final vows. It's about six minutes, it's really, really beautiful. You should check it out. If you would like to support this channel in any way, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee Let's get into this. So in one sentence, and again, this is in French, so I'm reading it in the French that I learned from high school, and I, I did actually foreign exchange in France, and I'm also using Google Translate, but there's not a lot to unpack in this sense. Let me tell you exactly what she says. The types of souls that dwell the least amount of time in purgatory are those that willingly accept death. That's it. That's what she says. Now, let's unpack this and what it means and the types of people that we should be. So first, I want to talk about time. The last action that we take is the most important because the way in which we're judged and the way that holiness works, it's like cumulative. So it has to lead to a certain place. So for instance, today when I was at Mass, they talked about the reading, why when I was good and now I'm bad and God, you condemn me. You know, that, that whole reading that talks about God, you're not just in your ways are not fair because I used to be good and now I'm not. That whole idea, why is that the case? The same with someone who used to be bad and now they're good. How come they can kind of get away with it? Because it's, it's a cumulative choice that we make. At the end of it, life is being presented to us. And we're making a series of decisions. And then at the end of our life, we're meant to make a choice for or against God. So if you have been a total whatever, and then get to the last point of your life and you choose, God, I love you. I surrender myself to your will. I accept death willingly. You've chosen to be a saint. And that is your choice. Time stops. A snapshot is taken of you, so to speak, and you are frozen at that state. Now, if you've lived a super religious life and pray all the time, and then you get to the end of your life and are begrudgingly accepting death, then everything that you did was literally for nothing. So you need to consider that. You need to understand to what you are aiming everything that you are doing. So all of you out there, I know all these videos that you're watching, all that you learn, all the virtues that you practice, all of that needs to go somewhere. It needs to lead to you making that final choice at the end of your life. All of us, we're all going to have different ways that we die. We're not all going to have these magical deathbed experiences where our last breath is, Jesus, I love you, or something like that. Who knows how we're going to die? The state in which you die at that moment, at that second, is the most important thing of your life because that determines the direction in which you go for all eternity. Think about that. It's like a stone being knocked or an object being knocked out in space. When you're knocked in a certain direction in space, you go on forever, forever and ever. Amen. So for this reason, it's extremely important that we think about that, that we take seriously certain prayers that we make in novenas. For instance, the grace of a happy death, that is of utter importance for us, but specifically a death that we willingly accept why? Why willingly accept death? Why didn't she say willingly accept God's will? Because God's will is manifested in the concrete. So it's not good for us to just accept God's will in theory, but then in practice, when it's actually taking place, for instance, let's say we die in a car crash, that we say, I love God's will, I love God's will, and then the car crash is happening and we're about to die and we're like, I hate this, I hate this. That doesn't work. We need to accept the concrete manifestations of God's will and whatever it is that we're seeing in the moment. 
So we need to practice that and, and have an openness of mind. For instance, God, I accept if I die suddenly. I accept if I die in a disease. I accept if I die with lots of people there. I accept if I die with no one there. Whatever it is, I accept. And that we start getting used to that idea, letting go of our preferences. St. Ignatius of Loyola speaks a lot about this in discernment, that we have a holy indifference, that we basically say, God, whatever you want, and I mean this, God, I am okay with, and I choose and I want. So we have to develop a spirituality of trusting deeply in Jesus. Where can we go for this? The answer is kind of at the end of the Lenten season, beginning of Easter in the Divine Mercy Devotion. One of the greatest fruits of the Divine Mercy Devotion is what the image says it is. Jesus, I trust in you. Specifically, why is Jesus saying that? For those difficult moments, that in those difficult moments, particularly death, we can genuinely say, no matter what the circumstances, Jesus, I trust in you. This is hard. You know, just a few weeks ago, I made a video about how it felt like in that plane that we were about to crash, and I was thinking, what's the state of my soul as I might die? It was hard. In fact, it felt impossible to say, Jesus, I trust in you. So I have some work to do, as many of us do. But we need to consider, what does that actually look like? How might we die trusting in God so that when we get to those situations, we are ready? This is something that we need to build throughout our life. We need to develop a close relationship with God that we genuinely feel that we can trust Him, not just in theory. I'm saying this a lot because I think a lot of us love God like the image of God, God in a painting, Jesus in a statue, but we don't like the reality. And so we need to really go beyond. We need to not just be statues of saints, but saints in the flesh. Saint Jose Maria used to say this a lot. One very important way for this to take place is through prayer. We need to, through prayer, ask God for many graces. In fact, I would suggest to you to ask God for mystical encounters with Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and God himself, who we encounter through Jesus, because we need to taste and see that the Lord is good for ourselves. Why? Because when we face death, it's not going to be enough to have read about it. It's not going to be enough for someone to have told you about it. Trust me, when you're dying, you're going to be freaking out. You're going to want to have your own personal experiences that you could really rely on. I have seen in my own life that my own personal experiences of God's tenderness have dramatically increased my trust in him because I know that he's trustworthy. I know that I could trust whatever is happening. Now, I want you to look at different situations where you struggle to trust God. Death is the most difficult one. So if you have any circumstances in which you struggle to trust God, you're not going to trust him in death. Do not deceive yourself on that one. So if you struggle to trust God when it comes to money, if you struggle to trust God when it comes to relationships, when it comes to sharing your faith, when it comes to encountering dangers, when it comes to your relationships, your children and your husband or your wife, um, or in any other situation that you can imagine, if there's any areas that you struggle to trust God in that situation, you need to think to yourself, well, then I probably will fail over here. First, conquer those which are easier. He who is faithful in small things will be faithful in larger ones. Death. Death is the largest one that we must face. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm not afraid of death. But then when they don't have a lot of money, they freak out. That doesn't make any sense. You need to kind of be able to recognize your own weakness so that you're ready so that at that moment of death, you can truly embrace it willingly. And of course, this is a supernatural grace. So we need to be asking when we receive the Eucharist, when we wear our miraculous medals or our scapulas, when we're doing all these different things, that we're not just using these as kind of like so that we feel safe, but that so that we receive that grace that will kick in in that final moment. That's something that we really need to pray for. That final moment is still up for grabs. We need to now decide how we want to shape it, 
how we want to make it be a situation in which the proper setting is set place. Okay, so what does this mean? That we have a happy death? That a priest is able to give us the graces? That maybe our family is surrounding us so that we can be well enough disposed and we could be able to say, wow, look at this. I, I can see that God is here. Jesus, I trust in you. I accept my death. As opposed to something that is so violent and scary that it shakes us and in that last moment of our life, we're not well disposed. My friends, I think this is one of the most supremely helpful and important topics for us to think about. Praise God for the gift of Anne-Marie Lindmeyer. Again, her book is Me Relation avec les âmes du purgatoire. If you understand French, Portuguese, or German, you can look that up. She was an amazing purgatory mystic, a Carmelite, and she has helped us in so many of these different videos. Again, please support this channel in any way. And as I promised, here is scenes from the final vows of Sister Alexia. Thank <laughs> you. 